and 1 Corinthians 15. Just for context, I'm going to back up to verse 35, but we'll focus on something a little bit deeper in the chapter shortly. 1 Corinthians 15. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. You see here, Paul is actually speaking eschatologically. That new body is, is what we are. Paul says, verse 37, when you sow, you do not plant the same body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of weed or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. Watch this, verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that would be Jesus, a life-giving spirit. Paul says the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. Again, he's juxtaposing Adam and Jesus. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, we shall so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Again, Paul is talking about the difference between the body that will be put in the grave and the body that will come out of it. Verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. A mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been closed with the immortality, or the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? You see, the sting of death is sin. Watch this. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say there's victory in Jesus. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Last week, I was doing some reading. And in the spirit of election, there is a state representative that serves 
the community uh, in Tarrant County. And she determined that she was not going to seek re-election. Uh, the reason that she's not going to seek re-election is because the state and the powers that be in the state, they have redrawn the districts and made it almost impossible for her to win. This is something that is referred to as gerrymandering. It's when the powers that be who are trying to make sure they stay in power purposefully draw a district so the person they want to win, even though there's an election, the election is legal, but the person that they want to win is going to win simply because they have drawn the district in such a way that the person they want to win will win. That's gerrymandering. And as I sat and thought about that, first of all, I got disturbed. Uh, gerrymandering is not new. It was something that has been done in our nation, especially in the South, to keep minorities disenfranchised as it relates to the political process. For it to still be going on a day and it still be perfectly legal says a lot about where we are as a nation. My sermon is not political. My premise is the purpose of the gerrymander is to make sure that the person, that the powers that be wants to win, will win. It's almost like cheating. It's almost like it not being fair. It's almost like what Paul just talked about. From that point of view, as it relates to your salvation and my salvation, as it relates to us being a part of God's family, it can be argued that God did a little gerrymandering, that God fixed this thing, that even though the devil is working against us, we are still able to be children of God. Even though sin is going on in us, we are still able to be children of God. Even though life is going on around us, we are still able to be children of God. And it's because the Lord God, the authority, not just of the state or the country, the world, he is the authority of the universe, has put a plan in place that's just not fair. God has done some spiritual gerrymandering, if you will, to make sure that through Jesus Christ, you and I have the ability to be elected. We're not elected because we're good or because we are uh, obedient, which is what Stephen was dealing with in Ephesians chapter 2. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any should boast. We are not what God has called us to be in and of ourselves. We are uh, or have the ability to be what God has called us to be and be in fellowship with God, not because of what you have done or what I have done, but rather because of what Jesus did. You see, God, through his son, he, he, he redrew the lines. He redrew the lines in such a way that people who were supposed to go to hell can now go to heaven. He redrew the lines where, where people who had sin nature, that's everybody, Lord have mercy, would have the ability to have God's nature. He, drew, he redrew the lines. That even though we're going to be planted a corruptible body, we're going to get up a, a, an incorruptible body. He redrew the lines. So as we go through here trying to do what God wants us to do, we do our best to put our best foot forward. And then we recognize, well, hey, I'm not doing enough. You are correct. You're not going to do enough. I'm not going to do enough. Nobody's going to be uh, do enough. But we're going to be accepted, not because... We do enough, but because Jesus did enough. Amen. See, the devil, he's kind of slick. Have, have you ever been, you know, kind of minding your own business, right? And he starts whispering, I'm talking about Satan. He'll whisper in your ear and say, hey, you ain't good enough. Y'all never had that? You had it? Just tell the truth, but, you know, we probably all had it. Uh, you ain't good enough. You know you're still struggling here, 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 and here. Right. They don't know you're doing it, but you know you're doing this, 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 and this. Right. See, you, you act like you have nothing wrong with you, but see, I'm with you when ain't nobody around, 
you got that, that the, those secret sins and, and that closet conduct. And, and if we focus on those things, I'm telling you, we'll get to a place where we'll start wondering, well, do I even need to be a Christian? Am I worthy to be a Christian? Am I worthy to be a child of God? But my premise is this. If the devil whispers to you and tells you you are not good enough, you kindly say, I know it. <laughs> I, I know I'm not good enough, but you have to understand, Mr. Satan, there is a gerrymandering spirit in God, and he has changed the lines that says even though I'm not good enough, I'm accepted anyway because I have been elected not by my goodness, but by Jesus Christ. Paul tells this beautiful story as, as he's talking to the Corinthians. He's, he's, he's wrapping up his letter, and, and, and he's telling them, hey, the, the body you in now, it, you're going to raise differently. You, you're going to get up a whole different situation. The, the struggles, the weaknesses, the, the death, the sickness, whatever is going on in this, this physical, this dustiness, that new body not going to be like that. That sin nature, that, 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 that urge that some of us have, hold on, I guess all of us have it. It, it, it comes in different ways, shapes, forms, and fashions, okay? But all of us have urges to do things that God says no to. Welcome to earth. Been eagerly awaiting your arrival. We all have that problem that nobody won't have in this situation. And even though he doesn't deal with it here in this text, one wonderful thing about that eschatological body, this is going on during that ideological time of Satan's body. He won't be there to mess with you anymore. Or mess with me or mess with us. However God fleshes that out, he, he fleshes it out. Uh, whether that's that, that time of binding or when he's already been uh, thrown into the lake of fire. How he works it out, he works it out. All I know is he won't have a ticket. He will not have an invitation. He will not be there to disturb us anymore, to tempt us, to mess with us, to remind us of foolishness. To have people going around doing evil all the time, the devil won't be there anymore. What makes a sermon like this okay is getting to a point in our faith that we're just willing to let go. Let go of what, preacher? Life. Paul is encouraging them to understand that the body they have is going to be traded in for better. Our natural tendency to fear death or not want to die sometimes takes us to a place in which we cannot accept or appreciate the blessing of going to that other place. Paul says, before you get that new body, you gotta get out, gotta get out of that old one. Before you get that incorruptible body, excuse me, before you get that incorruptible body, you have to let go of that corruptible. Before you get that spiritual, you gotta let go of the natural one. But you have to get to a point of faith where you're willing to let it go. Um, there's a lot I can say there in, in my personal life, in my personal journey. I understand. Let me, let me say it like this. I understand that that's not necessarily easy. Who wants to die, right? Who who wants to wake up and not be here anymore? Me, technically. But I realize I'm in a minority, okay? Me. Coleman, I never really liked it here. You know, it's cool. Never been suicidal. But I'm, I'm good with leaving. I, I really, really am. I like always talk to the church, you know, hey, I want to go be with the Lord, but it's good and beautiful that I remain. I'm not saying that to you. Okay? I'm sure you'll be fine without me. What I am saying is, trust me when I say that when you get to a point of your faith that you're not even afraid of death anymore, it, it, it transforms your faith. 
it, it transformed your mission. You see life differently. This is why Paul was able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It, it was why when he was facing death, he smiled. What you think I'm afraid of death, Paul says? Do you understand that if I die, if I leave here, I'm going to be in the presence of God? Do you understand that's a better situation than the one I'm in now? Sometimes we, it's good to be in the land of the living. Newsflash, this is not the land of the living, this is the land of the dying. Because everybody here is going through a dying process. This is the land of the dying. The land of the living is that new body. And we have to go through the land of the dying to get to the land of the living. What I want you to take from this lesson is God has fixed it. That no matter how hard life gets, no matter what we go through, no matter sickness or death, no matter brokenness, economic scenarios, political scenarios, no matter the injustice, no matter what this world has to offer. It's temporary. It's temporary. There will come a time when we will study war no more. There will come a time that everything will be made brand new. Being sold, planted, buried, in this body. Oh Lord have mercy. There's going to be a different body that gets up. When Gabriel is called to blow that trumpet. The Bible says the dead and the Lord are going to get up first. Raised incorruptible. You see when, 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 when we get there. This is an embodiment of Paul's words when he says the suffering that's going on on Sunday has nothing to do with the glory. The, the, the glory that awaits us is much greater than the struggles of today. We just have to get there. We have to keep our eyes on the glory as we go through the gloom. We have to keep our eyes on heaven as we go through hell. That's what the Christian has to do. But the good news is it's a fixed situation. God has changed the map that says those who should not be elected will still be elected because of Jesus Christ. If the devil is whispering to you, you're not good enough, tell him that you know. If the devil is telling you you're not worthy, tell him that you know. Thank you for telling me something, Mr. Satan, that I already know. I understand I'm not worthy. If life is beating on you, understand that that's it's temporary. You know, when I read, as I wrap this up, when I, when, I, when I read the history books by my ancestors who were brought to this nation as slaves, everything they had was stolen from them. The language, the land, the culture, the religion, the family, the history. They were literally stripped naked of everything that God had made them to be. But they found hope in what would happen, not in their lifetimes, but that would, what would happen later. And they sang songs because they learned to come to faith in Jesus. And they hoped for a better tomorrow. Even if they didn't live to see it, their ancestors would. I would. My Angelo says, if I'm saying it right, I am the dream and the hope of a slave. So I rise. As a Christian, even though because of our own sin, we have been stripped. We've lost everything. We can still find peace in what's going to happen later because of Jesus Christ. And even as he noted, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We are 
able to rise because he was lifted up. And in being lifted up, he changed. God changed everything. Fixed the election. Because at that point, it was his election. It was his choice. And he chose Jesus. And if you choose Jesus, then you reign with him. You reign with him. Be encouraged, family. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. We are here temporarily. We're here to do the bidding of God. Yes, we got to work through some things. Yes, we have to go through some things. We have to flesh out some things. We got to figure out some things. We got to cry. We're going to lose sleep. We're going to lose friends. Yes, that's part of being human. I'm not going to lie to you and say that that doesn't happen. Sure it does. And any preacher, any minister who says everything is going to be lit as a daffodils is lying. Those who work to live out the life of a Christian are going to suffer. That's the promise. That's what God says is going to happen. As a matter of fact, I've often warned Christians that if everything is going good in your life, you're probably doing something wrong. Because the devil ain't messing with you. And if he's not messing with you, that means he ain't worried about you. If it seems that he's always messing with you, smile. That means you're probably doing something right. Then again, you might be doing it to yourself. Either way, you and I are part of a gerrymandered situation. And even though we shouldn't win, we do. Because God has changed the election map. And he made it about Jesus. So if you are willing to give your life to him, if you're willing to do it his way, if you're willing, when you get to that point where you say, I tried it my way, I need to do it Yahweh. I need to do it God's way. I need Jesus to come along and, and fix this thing for me. I need Jesus to take the wheel. If you've gotten to that point, then give it to him. It's one thing to say, hey, I'm a believer. I, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian woman. I'm a Christian man. What did Jesus say about a fruit? You judge a tree by its fruit. I can say all day that I'm an apple tree, but if I'm bearing oranges. A lot of times when it comes to our faith, what I'm saying is to truly give it to him, the fruit of life will demonstrate that it's been given to him. The fruit of life doesn't mean that we're going to do everything right. No ma'am and no sir. It does mean that he becomes the north on our compass of life. And as we're making life decisions, it's no longer I think this, I want that. It's not my will but yours. God, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to deal with this situation? Who do you want me to be with? What do you want me to work? What do you want me to study? We don't do anything without approaching him. Because he knows better than we do. And we understand in our weaknesses, in our flesh, there's no good thing. We've tried. We've done what we thought was right. You know, there's a, there's a way it seems right to a man. But then there are other, other ways of death or destruction. We, we've done it our way. And we're just digging the hole deeper and deeper. At what point do we decide I'm not going to keep digging this hole in my life because it's not working for me? God, can you come and fix this? Behold, God says, I stand at the door and knock, and if you let me in, I will come. We will have fellowship one with another, and I will fix you. But we're too busy breaking our own selves. This is not the time to live out. The famous words of the movie, Break Yourself. This is the time that we say, Father, I'm broken. Oh, Lord, I've tried it my way. No matter what I've done, it's failed. And I'm just continuing to break myself more and more and more. Can you come and fix me? God just simply 
say something along the lines, I've been waiting for you to answer me. I've been anticipating the time when you would give me your life and let me be what I am. Father. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for the word, even as we've considered Paul's words to the church at Corinth. As he discusses the eschatological body, how we are planted in one body and raised in a different body, how this corruptible body has to put on incorruption. And we consider why and how, the who, who makes it possible for this corruption to be raised in incorruption. It's Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Father, we've discussed how you changed the situation, you fixed it in such a way that every human, even as sinners, God, have the ability to be elected because you changed the man. You sent Jesus to die, so through him, all are drawn unto you. Father, for that we say thank. Thank you, God. Thank you. Where would we be if it wasn't for him? Thank you. Help us, God, as a church of Jesus Christ to live this out, to share with our fellow men and women the beauty of being a believer. The honor of being holy. The friendliness, Father, of being in fellowship with you. They don't have to suffer alone. They don't have to walk alone. They don't have to figure things out for themselves. You're there. Your son, your spirit, the church, all working together to be the salt, to be the light, to help people see there's a better way. And his name is Jesus Christ. So many times we're, we're mute rather than telling everyone the goodness or living it out through exemplification of the goodness of being in Christ. We walk around as if we're not in Christ. We don't demonstrate the faith we live in fear. We allow the world to, to weigh us down because we're still carrying around the very things that you have beckoned us to give to you. We're still using worldly ways to get through life. And it's not working for us. Even though we're saved, even though we're your people, we're still living as if we're not. How can we demonstrate How to walk by faith if we ourselves refuse to do the same. So I say again, Father, please help us. Help us to embody that so the world can see the light of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, Father. And this we pray in his name. Amen.